Praise the Lord, everybody. Can we just give the Lord some praise? No, no, no. Can we give the Lord some praise like we mean it, like we love him, like he's done something for us, like we're grateful that he's God and he's God all by himself, like we know him in the pardon of our sins, like he brought us through this and he brought us through that and we're grateful. Can we just give him some praise? Because truly he deserves our praise. I tell you, when I realized it was youth day, I kept, I struggled over there and I kept saying, Lord, do I need to preach something different? But the Holy Spirit said, no. Because for such a time as this, this is the word I need you to give to these people. Amen. So I, I believe it will bless the youth, but I believe it will bless the house, more importantly. If you have your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. And I only want to read one verse into your hearing, and that's verse 10. If you have it, you'll find these words, and if you do it in this house, if you'll stand in reverence of God's word. 1 Peter 5, verse 10. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Play with me if you will. Heavenly Father, less of me and more of thee. Lord God, as I stand before these your people to preach your unadulterated word, I ask now, Heavenly Father, that you would sit Michelle down and God, I need you to stand up. I ask, Lord God, that you would shut Michelle up. And Lord, I need you to speak up. God, I ask that as I deliver what thus saith the Lord, that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. For Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. And all of God's people say amen. Amen. You may be seated. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. I've chosen for a subject, there will be glory after this. There will be glory after this, it, as I reflected upon what I would share this morning, I could not help but reflect upon all that is happening, not only in this country, but upon all that has happened in my own life. And if we'd be honest, as a result of all that has unfolded over the course of the past two years, Many of us don't see things the way we used to. COVID-19 and its variants have seemingly changed the world. American families lost over 986,000 loved ones. Millions lost their jobs and often their employer-sponsored health care. The American Institute of Economic Research suggests that life in America is not going to be the same after COVID-19. Like the Great Depression and World War II, the pandemic will exert an impact on the nation's economic and political fortunes for years to come. In addition, 2021, left us with many challenges to overcome. Despite convictions in the murder of Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd, racism and white supremacy are still alive and well in America. And although we are in the first quarter of a brand new year, some things will and have remained the same. 
in spite of the revelation of the injustices, racial equality in the criminal justice system is still very hard to get. And the average net worth and average income of African Americans continues to fall below most racial groups. And while some things have stayed the same, we've also had some major changes. Many of us have changed jobs, partnerships, memberships, spouses, friendships, and fellowships, and even our church homes. Many suffer from the aftermath of broken relationships, shattered dreams and alienation from families, dashed hopes and loneliness, discrimination, grief, and all kinds of addictions and abuses. We've experienced loss after loss and hurt after hurt. There has been one trial after another, one pain after another, one disappointment after another, one heartache after another, one death after another, and you, you fill in the blank for your own personal life. And all of this speaks to the prevalence of suffering. We've all heard it, when it rains, it pours. But I tell you, not only is it raining, I think that in my own immediate and extended families, we would probably say that for us, it seems as though it has been storming for quite some time. See, my orders to Herbert Field began on February 15th of this year. And what's so amazing for me about this is that seven years ago, I served a backfield here. As a matter of fact, seven years ago, I preached at Greg Chapel. But things have changed in my own life quite a bit since that time. You see, while changing planes in Fort Walton Beach, or changing planes in Charlotte on my way to Fort Walton Beach, I got a call from my niece informing me that my sister had just taken her last breath. She was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia in November of 2020, received a bone marrow transplant in May of 2021, and was in remission. But in October 2021, we learned that the cancer was back. She fought till she could fight no more and went home to be with the Lord. But her death was the most recent of the many that my family would experience since I left Fort Walton Beach in 2015. You see, while I was here in 2015, my husband Michael was here with me. But in September of 2016, his life was snatched from us when he suffered a massive heart attack while sitting at his desk preparing to leave work. In that same year, within a six-month span, we buried my husband, two of his brothers, and his niece. Two years later, in October of 2018, my niece, who was the mother of five children, passed away. Then three weeks later, my mom passed away, followed by my sister-in-law's death just two weeks later. As if that were not enough, after spending the morning with my baby brother in October of the next year, I received a call that evening informing me that he had been shot and killed after an altercation with a young man that he'd had an argument with 20 years prior. On the day we buried my baby brother, my elder paternal brother passed away unexpectedly. So since seeing you here seven years ago, I've buried my husband, three brothers-in-law, two nieces, my mother, and two brothers. In addition, we buried my mom's two younger sisters. But my brothers and my sisters, I stand here and I tell you this, not 
as one who is hopeless, but one filled with hope. I'm encouraged by the lyrics of a song written in 2012 by an artist by the name of J.J. Harrison, which speaks not only into my situation, but into the lives of all of those who trust in the Lord. You see, the song gives to us a prophetic word. Because the song speaks not only of our present, but it speaks into our future. The song speaks of what the scripture said that was read that says, my peace, I leave with you. Because the song tells us that there will be glory after this. As a matter of fact, it says there will be victory after this. God will turn it around and he will bring you out, but there will be glory after this. J.J. Harrison encourages those who find themselves suffering that in spite of what they're going through, there will be glory after this. The same is true of our text this morning. You see, the book of Peter is written to those who are suffering. Peter, the writer, tells this great epistle that we ought to um, be encouraged and be comforted even in the midst of our painful situations. Anybody in here other than me experienced some pain over the course of the past two years? Has anybody experienced some losses and some hurts? See, see, here's what's surprising about Peter's letter to those who are suffering. Peter does not focus on the suffering. But Peter focuses on the significance that God has for the suffering that they are experiencing. In other words, Peter focuses on the purpose for their pain. See, oftentimes we will try to bypass or sidestep and escape our pain. But I stopped by to remind us this morning that in life there will be some suffering. There will be some trials and some tribulations. But it is after you have suffered, gone through the hurt, cried the tears and maybe even shed some blood. It's after the surgery, after the dialysis, after the radiation, after the chemotherapy, after mama beat your butt for doing what you're not supposed to do, after being on life support, there will be glory in the end. You see, there'll be times when it will seem as though we're perishing from a human perspective. But we are in essence being blessed, uplifted, and exalted in the spiritual sense. So I've come this morning to remind us that when we find ourselves going through certain situations or circumstances, enduring the storms of life, there is always hope. When our backs are against the wall, loved ones are being taken, resources are drying up, and the enemies are on every side, there is no need to focus on the situation that you find yourself in. Concentrate on what God is up to in the midst of your suffering. My sisters and my brothers, as a result of all that I've experienced, I am different than I was before. And through it all, I understand that it is God who brought us. It's God who taught us. It's God who kept us and never left us. And that same God will continue to be our constant companion in the darkest hours of our days. There will be glory after this. If we'll take this text seriously, we will see that Jesus too suffered, but he always kept hope alive. Don't allow suffering to steal your joy or kill your hope. Remain hopeful, understanding that after the suffering is over, God will have completed a great work in us, which will lead us towards our greater 
purpose that he is preparing us for. After you go through what you've gone through, look back and see what the Lord has done. The premise of this message is to encourage every believer that they have to go through trials and suffering. But it is after the pain and the suffering that they will realize that God was at work doing something greater in their lives. So the question for us this morning is, what will we as believers who suffer discover after that brief moment of agony is over? The text reveals some principles that we will discover, discover after we, the faithful believers, suffer for a little while. The first of the three is in the A clause of verse 10. After you suffer, you realize God's amazing grace was always in place. The text says, and the God of all grace. The Greek word for grace is unmerited favor given to humanity by a loving God. What that really means is grace could not be worked for, paid for, or obtained through any labor or bartering system. But grace can only be given from the Father through his Son, Jesus Christ, to all humanity. To make it plain, after you suffer a little while, you not only understand that grace was in place, but you understand that all grace was in place. See, grace only comes in one degree. And that's all. See, God doesn't give us one-fourth of his grace, nor does he give us three-quarters of his grace, but God gives us all of his grace. You can ask the great hymn writer John Newton about grace. He was the English slave trader who was lost on the continent of Africa, but was miraculously found after his father pled to a ship captain to look for his son and bring his son home at any cost. John Newton was eventually found and transported back to his father. And along the way, he took out his pen and began to write Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. For Newton, the greatness of all grace being with and upon him was not fully realized until his suffering in Africa was over. It was on his way back home that he not only realized grace was in place, but he described it as being amazing grace. We, like Newton, are trapped and lost by trial and tribulation. And God the Father has sent the captain of a ship to save sinners just like us. And that captain's name is Jesus. And our song is I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters he lifted me, now safe. Am I God extended all grace? And all grace has never been overridden by suffering. And grace will not be outlasted by suffering. Grace is the undefeated, undisputed champion of the world. So no matter what you've been through or what you find yourself going through, God's grace is right there with you, and God's grace is sufficient. After we suffer, we realize that God's amazing grace was always in place. And it countered temporary suffering. But the second realization is, after you have suffered, the call on your life can never be aborted. In other words, nobody can take the call from you. The Greek word call means that God himself has invited us into his presence with a loud, clear voice. And having invited us, gave us his name 
and he put a title on us. In other words, my brothers and my sisters, this word call means that the suffering only made the calling clearer. The calling is maybe not a formal ministry like that of pastor, but this calling was for believers to realize that God had a special purpose, a special mission for them to carry out and had placed a special brand upon them that I've identified them with the kingdom. My brothers and my sisters, that special brand that identified us with the kingdom and determined that we were called was the glory of God. The text goes on to read here that we were called to his eternal glory. Glory is the Greek word doxa, and it means that the splendor, the majesty, the brightness and the dignity and the anointing of God rested on those who suffered for a little while. Even through the suffering that was temporary, there was hope in the glory that resided upon our lives. And that glory reminded us that we have a mission to win souls for Christ. A mission to show strength. A mission to persevere. A mission to overcome so that the world might see God in us. It was after the suffering that the call hurled us to a glory that could not be erased, eradicated, eliminated, or mutilated. But it perfected us and provoked us an excellency. And we became the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Thus, temporary suffering confirmed our call. So after you've suffered, you realize that God's amazing grace was always in place and that it countered temporary suffering. And you realize that the call on your life could never be aborted. But finally, after you have suffered, you realize that God was in fact doing an internal work. The text says, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. See, this internal work that was realized after the suffering was threefold. It, consist, it consisted of spiritual restoration, strengthening you, making you firm and steadfast. Spiritual restoration concerns that, that God was mending, that what God was mending was broken in us, adjusting us, equipping us, and completing us for success. In other words, God was making us what we are called to be so that we can live out our God-given purpose and exploit our fullest potential. The work of strengthening was feeding us the right spiritual knowledge and giving us the proper nutri nutrients from his word. In other words, the weight of suffering strengthened the believer as he or she endured. It is the equivalent of giving spinach to Popeye. It makes you stronger, builds spiritual muscles, and helps you to stand your ground. And then lastly, the idea of being firm and steadfast is the Greek word to have a firm foundation that grounds and settles you firmly in place. In other words, this temporary suffering helps you to realize that you have a firm foundation. And that firm foundation is Christ. These three can only be realized since they're lived out practically after you have suffered. After you have suffered, you'll see God restoring you spiritually and perfecting you. After you've suffered, you'll see God strengthening you and giving you spiritual muscles. After you've suffered, you'll see that God was setting you on a sure foundation and you could not be moved. And just in case you, like I, have found yourself enduring suffering, after that moment of suffering is over and the smoke clears, you will see a God, our Father, using Jesus, his work, 
his son to work in your life. Be encouraged and hopefully fully realize that in suffering, the Savior is our source. He is our source of peace, our source of strength, our source of restoration, and our source of all grace. And when you suffer, know that you have not been alone. And that there are others who on the other side of that moment of suffering realized that God was up to something new and wonderful and was taking them to a place they had never been. So if you're suffering, be encouraged. And on the other side of your suffering, God will put a new song in your mouth. After you've suffered, your song will be blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. After you suffer, you'll sing what? A fellowship. What a joy divine. I'm leaning on the everlasting arms. After you suffer, you'll be able to sing what? Almighty God, we serve. The angels bow before him and heaven and earth adore him. But what a mighty God we serve. Your song might be when I look back over my life and I think things over. I can truly say that I've been blessed. I've got a testimony. Or you might sing like the late Reverend Timothy Wright saying, you brought me through this and you brought me through that. But Lord, I'm so grateful. The hymn knowledges of old gives us yet another song. Build your hopes on things eternal, but hold to God's unchanging hand. After you've suffered, you'll be able to sing about your deliverance, your freedom, and your salvation. In an old hymn of the church, you will be reminded of God's sacrifice that brought us to the other side of that temporary moment of suffering. In that moment, we'll be able to sing, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign died. Would he devote a sacred head for such a worm as I? It was at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Post-suffering I can sing another hymn, There Shall Be Showers of Blessings, Showers of Blessings. We need mercy drops round us are falling, but for these showers, we plead after his suffering. After his suffering, Jesus was actually buried in a grave, but he was victorious over death, hell, and the grave, and we, like Jesus, can rise from our suffering and declare the same victory. And finally realize that after we have suffered, we will have everlasting life through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We will realize that even in the midst of our suffering, there will be glory after this. My sisters and my brothers, hold on because the suffering is temporary. Hold on because the suffering won't last always. Hold on because weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You ought to give the Lord some praise because there will be glory after this. This is God's word for God's people. May you eat this word, digest this word, and leave here living this word knowing there will be glory after this. There will be glory after this. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't waddle in self-pity. Don't have pity parties. Have praise parties. Praise your way through knowing there will be glory after this. Amen? Amen. Amen.